Thank you for joining Accelero's Quality Collaborative. Today's Quality Collaborative is centered around the impact of timing and process on quality for the total joint replacement patients. I am Michelle Bianco, VP of Operations at Accelero, and I will be moderating today's discussion with Tim Sweeten, who leads our perioperative division, and Jenna DeSormier, a senior director with expertise in the advancement of joint replacement programs. From a housekeeping manner, we will be asking you to participate in this discussion in a few ways. We will have polling questions throughout today's presentation in order to garner feedback from you. They will appear on the right side of your screen during the, on the, right side of your screen during the question and answer section. Please use the hand raise feature, as you can see here on the slide, in order to ask a question. Also, at any time, feel free to send a chat message directly to the presenter, and we'll be able to address those questions later on in the presentation. Okay, let's get started. I believe we can all agree that as healthcare providers, we have the best intention to provide quality care. Unfortunately, intention doesn't always lead directly to execution. Sometimes people and processes limit our ability to achieve quality outcomes and an experience for our patients. Diagnostic, therapeutic, defined in the notorious classical quality chasm, the functional qualities of high quality health care are to be safe, effective, patient-centered, efficient, equitable, and timely. And today we'll discuss how these fundamentals are often challenged during a total joint replacement patient's experience. We will provide examples of best practices that we have seen across the country in order to create a better experience, not only for your patients, but also for your care providers, all leading to a better quality outcome. What you see here is a list of key elements important in achieving quality outcomes. During today's presentation, we will discuss how several of these elements can increase the predictability of care and outcome through planning, preparation, and organization of not only your people, but your processes. So what you see here is really a dramatic uh, worst case scenario that occurs in total joint replacement patients. And if you reflect on the variability that occurs at your hospital, you might say that the, this preoperative element listed occurs with some physicians, not necessarily with the others, or elements listed in the day of surgery occur well on Monday, but Thursday they're not occurring consistently. Today's discussion with Jenna and Tim will discuss on process and operational outcomes that when implemented increase your likelihood of having quality care and a predictable outcome with all patients, regardless of the day of the week, the surgeon, or the care provider. Yeah, that's exactly right. This is uh, Tim. A couple things we look at when we see worst case scenario, things that come to mind. Number one, the surgeon puts a patient on wherever he or she has an open spot um, in their block so not allowing for true optimization of the patient or the schedule. Another uh, issue that we see frequently is a patient arri arriving for surgery at 5 a.m., bright and early, ready to go, but they're not going back until five hours later for, uh, for their surgery. Hello, this is Jenna. Uh, when we look at the inpatient stay, there are many things that can go wrong, I'm sure all of you know. One such uh, element is when the patient finally does make it up to the unit, that PT or OT is unable to see the patient because they're either gone or they're scheduled to be seeing someone else at that time. And when we think about the post-acute setting, all of these you know, worst-case scenario elements can lead to that horrible thing we don't want to happen is either uh, a revision surgery, a reoperation, or need that patient needing a manipulation under anesthesia. Those are great examples of some of the challenges we've seen in hospitals. The goal here is to create consistent operational processes, again, to ensure the outcome you desire for your patients. So, Jenna, let's start the discussion with the uh, preparation and the importance of how to prepare a patient. Sure. The first component of quality we want to talk about today is the idea of preparation. Preparation leads to a more predictable process and, therefore, less variation, which will lead to fewer complications, fewer readmissions, or medical or medication errors. Preparation does take time, but the more time you spend ahead of the patient's arrival, the more time the patient is in the hospital. The patient should be prepared mentally and physically for the road ahead of them. 
A key part in patient preparation is patient optimization. Before we get into the goals and elements of a patient optimization program, we want to start with a polling question for you to understand the situations each of you is facing at your respective hospitals. So please use the box to the right that you see that has come up to answer this question. Do you have a formal preoperative patient optimization process? A is yes, it works well, we've got a great one, we can always count on it. B, yes, but it's kind of hit or miss, it doesn't always work for us. Or C, nope, we don't have anything. Let's see, we're getting in some answers, so that's exciting <laughs> to see. <laughs> A few more people left to answer. This is great. It's like a real-time score or yeah. something. I like it. All right. So we're waiting to um, have all of the questions, sub the responses submitted, and then we'll be able to share with you those results. It looks like we have a mix between it works well consistently, not always working, answer B or C. So we see a, a scattering of responses, which is what we typically see when we go into hospitals. And We'll say that patient optimization is probably one of the most challenging processes that we work with in terms of implementing a joint replacement program, and understandably so. There are many opportunities for variation between the point of surgical decision to admission, and you have to deal with a lot of surgeons on top of that in terms of their varying practices. So Jenna, can you discuss some approaches to really refine that patient optimization approach and create consistency? Absolutely. Let's, let's go back a little bit first and review the goal of patient optimization. Historically, the one goal um, that everyone worried about was surgical survival. Would the patient wake up after surgery? It really has gotten um, much bigger at uh, this point, and it's important to really concentrate on the much larger picture that the patient you needs to participate in his or her recovery. And should actually be able to thrive after their discharge from the hospital. And then, of course, um, when we think about the hospital operations, avoiding any kind of can case cancellations or postponements. It's important to have a standard process because it's imperative to have enough time to complete it. Inadequate timing can be the downfall with many programs that we see. They have this great process in place but don't enforce the timing of events, so the process is less effective or ineffective. You have to give everyone enough time to prep the patient. Each patient has their own critical cog and wheel. When we say preoperative patient optimization process, we're including H&P, any routine labs or tests that are ordered, the patient's PAT appointment, and subsequently any optimization or visits to ensure that patient is in the best health possible going into surgery. The process itself can be organized very differently depending on the provider makeup or the political climate in your area. You'll see three different processes highlighted in front of you. That first one is uh, a preoperative clinic where each patient goes through that clinic depending on, regardless, I guess, of their health status, whether they're healthy, they've got multiple comorbidities, or they've just got one or two. Everyone hits that PAT appointment, they see, they get their um, screening done, they get any pre-optimization that they need, and then they are ready to go to the hospital. And less, a different version of that is uh, separating high-risk patients from your more low-risk patients. So those high-risk patients will go through that preoperative clinic, and those lower-risk patients would just go through the regular path of going to their primary care physician. process. So it's, you have, the hospital has a little less control over it, um, but you have to put a lot more pieces together and more elements together so those primary care physicians know what their responsibility is and what you want that patient to look like um, and show up when they get to the hospital. Thanks, Jenna. That was helpful to share really a, a broad scope of how we define various patient optimization approaches. In order to create consistency, how detailed do you really need to be with the process and the strategy? 
we recommend making it as detailed as possible, which we know can be a very arduous task. Using a swim lane document like you see here can be very helpful um, in the, as a tool to plot the process out. If you're unfamiliar with swim lane document, it's essentially this grid that you're looking at that has the providers along the y-axis to the left and the timeline across the x-axis above. Within the document are the elements of the patient optimization process that you can The elements fall within a box that delineates who is responsible for completing it, when it, and when it should be completed. This is a great way to break down all of the elements of the process, establish who is responsible for what, and who needs to communicate what with whom, as well as the proper flow that every patient should experience. In this example, up in the top left corner, the surgeon office, they have nine different elements that should be completed in that process. A lot of them are scheduling so that patient is ready to go for the different elements. When we get down to the specialist, that patient should hit that specialist second if they're currently being seen by any specialist. And that information goes back to the surgeon and goes off to the hospital as well so that information is shared with the appropriate people. This can be a large project to take on, and we do see some common, cha common challenges pop up at many of our partners during either the creation of this or the maintenance of it. So when we look at the common challenges we see, these are our top five. I'm going to touch on three of the most important ones that we see. Firstly, there's no responsible party or owner of the process. If no one is overseeing the entire process, pieces can get dropped and workarounds are created and then all of a sudden you don't have a process anymore because everyone's created their own workaround. Secondly, there's a poor, there's poor organization and communication. No one's completely sure what their responsibility is or who to send the information to or what's supposed to happen next. And then lastly, there's a low provider buy-in. Either the surgeons, the anesthesiologists, the hospitals, the PCPs, or all of them don't feel it's necessary or don't believe it will help in meeting the goal of better preparing the patient without hopelessly clogging up the system. Jenna, I agree with your comments on the obstacles we have seen with preoperative patient optimization. I'll say that I have also seen this true regardless of the size of the hospital. Both small and large systems have challenges. I will say that it's magnified with a higher number of surgeons involved. It just adds more opportunity for variability within the process. We know it takes deliberate strategies and processes to ensure effective implementation of the defined patient optimization approach. So what specific strategies are you recommending? You're correct, Michelle, that these challenges pop up regardless of size of the hospital. It's because of the process, not because of the volume. Providers are usually reluctant to start something like this because they believe it's going to slow them down, it's going to create more work for them or their staff, or just plain isn't necessary because his or uh, her population just doesn't need this type of care. The best ways to combat this are with upfront, honest discussions about sharing the workload and sh then also sharing data with them. The surgeons, their office staff, and the hospital all need to sit down together to plot out the path and decide who owns what. <laughs> If investments are to be made, the group needs to decide together who is going to make which investments, either in time, in staffing, or in money, and then, of course, what each should get expect back from their investment. Sharing data with the providers is the best way to illustrate any issues or problems that currently exist, as well as demonstrate the effects of the new process. For example, at a hospital in the Midwest West we've worked with, we pulled data on two different physicians. One uses their optimization program over 85% of the time, and a second who doesn't. The differences were drastic. The first physician had a 5% complication rate, while the second had a 14% complication rate. The first is able to discharge uh, over 85% of his patients home, while the second is only close to about 75%. When it comes to clearing a patient for surgery, most of this confusion and the problems are due to dueling ideas of what it actually means for the patient to be cleared for surgery by all of the different anesthesiologists that you work with. The best way to combat this is to standardize the clearance and testing protocols. Get all of the investors, invested providers together in a room and create a unified system of testing so that they only get the results that they want and need to make a decision. You can create a grid depicting low risk, moderate risk, and high risk patients and then the associated optimization protocol to get the patient to cleared status. That way, when it comes time for the anesthesiologist to decide whether the patient should proceed to surgery or not, 
everyone's working from the same guidelines. It's also essential to track the patient through the system. That way, if the patient falls off the pathway or something doesn't happen to the patient, you have a record of what did or didn't happen during the preoperative process and when it happened or when it was supposed to happen. Knowing the patient needs a cardiologist workup two days before the scheduled surgery helps no one. You also have the ability to fix issues sooner and fix the real problem, not the anecdotal one. But this process doesn't even need an owner and a tracking system, so it's best if there's some sort of a navigator to see this process. Jenna, that was very helpful. And I think we would all agree that to have an educated and optimized patient is really the best scenario. You can certainly mitigate many risks when you follow that process. But no less important is to ensure the staff and the providers are equally prepared for that predictable surgical and postoperative care experience. Tim, walk us through what that might look like. Yeah, absolutely. So when we go around and talk to folks at the hospital about planning, most people will um, certainly agree with our 16th president that planning is important and spending the time preparing before, uh, before you do a task will often make doing that task all that, uh, that easier. So when I talk to folks, they say, yeah, you know, there's rounding on the unit every morning, huddles in the OR to look at the daily schedule, the surgeon and their PA are planning for their uh, component of it. One thing that I, we don't typically see as normal, but certainly something that we recommend, is having all those groups of people talk to each other about the elective schedule. And they can do that a week out, a week ahead of time, for particularly their joint replacement patients, to bring everything together for a seamless operation on the day of surgery as well as beyond. So it's something that we, are, we strongly recommend and really work with hospitals to implement. So I'm going to ask a question uh, at this time, a poll question, so get ready for that. Uh, get ready to participate. Do you have your multidisciplinary team a planning meeting prior to the day of surgery? And you use this time to discuss the patient's surgery, their length of stay, everything that's going to happen to them once they arrive at your hospital. So as you see the, uh, the, the, the um, respondents there, yes, we do have this in place and it is attended by everybody, um, anesthesia, surgeons, their PAs, OR, unit nursing, PT, and so on. Yes, we do have a weekly team meeting, but it's not multidisciplinary. Maybe it's just the OR, maybe it's just the unit, but it's isolated, it's in silos. Or the third choice, C, is just a flat no. We're not spending the time. We can't spend the time. We're not, we don't have the time or the resources to do that. So no, we don't have that in place. So it looks like we've got some results coming in. What I'm seeing here, and a few more are trickling in, but uh, you know, I'm seeing very few have yes, and it is attended, as well attended, by a multidisciplinary team. Um, so that's about 5%. Uh, yes, but it's not attended well, or not by, an, uh, I shouldn't say that, but it's not attended by a multidisciplinary team. Um, and then most of the respondents that I'm hearing from the group or seeing from the group are just a flat no. So it looks to me like this is something, a real, an area of real opportunity. I'm going to move forward now. Let's talk about some of the particulars of the, what we call a weekly surgical case review. So first of all, on the left-hand side, you can see what it is. It's a, essentially a, a multidisciplinary team that talks about each uh, elective joint replacement scheduled for the following week. goes through, and I'm going to go through a lot of detail here, but just as an overview, purpose and outcomes, number one, there are absolutely no surprises for the day of surgery. No surprises for the labs, for the anesthesia type equipment needed. Um, this has a, has a major impact on the OR efficiency as well as surgical outcomes. You can see another outcome is the order of the cases on the surgical schedule can be optimized. This means that we're not starting with a revision, then we're going to, um, you know, a revision, then bilateral, and then a scope, and then a knee. You know, looking at the, the schedule in a way that you can set yourself up, the OR can set itself up for an optimized, efficient day. Expected to stay on the unit, including the PTOT discharge plan, that has an impact, a positive impact on length of stay and outcomes. And then finally, but certainly not least, is the patient perception of a seamless encounter. So this has a direct um, uh, impact, positive impact, to patient satisfaction scores because the patient no longer shows up 
and thinks, you know, how could you guys not know I was coming? You know, when you go to a hotel and you check in, they, they'll greet you by name. They know everything about you. They've got a little goodie bag for you. We should be no, doing no less at our hospitals as well. Patients have come to expect that. I, I'm putting in a picture here. This is Dr. Booth, a surgeon that we work with out of Philadelphia. Some of you might know him. Took a picture of his weekly surgical case review. And you can see he's gotten, you know, his PA is in there, his office manager. Over to the left, kind of behind um, his PA is, uh, is anesthesia, and there's other people in the room. And he is going uh, through all of his cases for the following week. And as a reminder for those of you who don't know, Dr. Booth is doing 12 to 14 cases each day, and he reviews every single one of them with this multidisciplinary team. They did it because they wanted to, for many reasons, not the least of which is to have a positive impact on their cancellation rate. They got that down to less than 1%, and they got their attendance to PAT, pre-admission testing, at 99%. So as you can imagine, what, I heard, what we heard uh, Jenna talk about, optimizing the patient is so critical well before they come to, the, to uh, their, their day of surgery or day of service. So you might be asking yourself, who should attend this meeting? That's an excellent question. We really believe that the, the patient is in the center of everything. And the people who should be talking about that patient are the surgeon, the surgeon's PA, the ortho team leader, the vendor rep. Please you know, take note of that. That's important from an equipment standpoint, making sure everything is there. Involve the vendor rep in that. PTOT, um, the PAT representative, anesthesia, joint navigator. This is not an all-inclusive list. You have to tailor it for what you have available at your uh, hospital. But I think that you're getting a sense of the true multidisciplinary nature of this particular team. And just think about what each of those people can bring, their perspective on optimizing that patient and the schedule to create a truly remarkable experience. Uh, my clicker died. There we go. Often when we are implementing this, we are asked, what should I expect at this meeting? We get some pushback because it's something somewhat unusual, especially when they see the, the list of individuals who, be, who will be attending this weekly meeting. You know, nobody looks at their schedule and says, oh, great, another meeting. Thank goodness I've got another meeting to go to. I was worried that I'd have some free time. So we really want to make sure that people understand what they should expect. So I pulled a few things out, but certainly it's not all encompassing. But for the surgeon, that surgeon needs to talk about their patient detail. Bring x-rays if necessary. They're going to review with the meeting attendees. Um, and the surgeon's role is to read out loud, run down each patient's medical detail and their plan for surgery. Because you can see this aid in deciding the order of procedure on the schedule and the equipment needed and everything else. Anesthesia needs to talk about the patient's results from pre-admission testing, pain management plan and protocol, the ASA score and how they arrived at that. For the staff, they need to come prepared to ask questions regarding your, their area of expertise, ask questions if they have concerns. This is truly a round table where everybody has a voice in, in talking about that patient and their safe and effective care for that day. Last, uh, no, I should say, next thing I want to talk about, the next question we always get, how long is this going to take? Excellent question, I thought. So it's important for everyone to realize this should be a quick hit. This is not a chart review of every single patient. That would take a very long time. And of course, it's different for every hospital, and it's different for every patient. But I wanted to give you some idea of what that might look like. The agenda is simple. This is really managing by acceptance, uh, uh, exception. If there aren't issues, we're going to hit the patient and move on, right? talk about the patient and move on. But if, if you wanted to think about it in this way, um, some patients will have no concerns. You can see. In scenario one, they have five patients on the schedule. There's no concerns. That's going to take five minutes. Scenario two has four patients with no concern. One does have a concern. They are diabetic. They need to be moved on the schedule. They have a high BMI. Whatever it happens to be, someone from the team is bringing up and red flagging that. So it's going to take a little bit longer to talk about that. We may need a different bed. We need to alert to whomever. Scenario three, you can see, I don't need to walk through it. There's, you can see in that one there is one person with many concerns on the schedule. So that takes a lot more conversation, a lot more dialogue about that patient's condition and what's going to make provide for a safe and effective care. Of course, scenario four was probably the worst case where there's only a few with no concern and the majority have some or many concerns. So what does this look like? Here's an example of an agenda that we put together for a hospital we worked with a couple of years, about a year or two years ago or so. And it's going to vary for, uh, it's going to differ for each hospital. 
Um, so this is not a cut and paste exercise, but I want you to kind of think about or, or see it in this way to kind of think about who would talk about what. So in this case, we created for them the patient names across the top, of course, and then the different things that were important to that particular hospital, their day of surgery, when that was going to happen, what procedure was going to be, age, height, do they have special needs, do they have a latex or do they have allergies, um, what labs will need to be done on the day of surgery uh, versus that's unusual. Of course, we don't put everything in there that the normal protocols call for, what ASA score they are, and so on. When this hospital, when this team, surgery team, was done reviewing their patients for the day, they knew everything about the patients that they needed to know, and everybody knew about them. They knew where they belonged on the schedule. In fact, the first time we did this, we went down, and what they thought was going to be a simple ankle procedure turned into that wasn't the type of procedure it was going to be at all. And so they had to move, make, make some uh, radical changes quickly to make sure all the equipment was going to be there for that patient. So they were bought in from day one when they saw how this could really help them on the day of surgery. Last poll I want to take uh, at, at, the point, at this point is when is your elective surgical schedule closed? could be a tricky question, right? So is it, excuse me, one day before, two days before, greater than two days before, or hey, guess what? It's not ever really closed. People can put stuff on a schedule up until that day. And of course, I'm not talking about your trauma or your fractures. I mean your elective joints and, and so on. So think about your ORs. Think about uh, your surgeons and who's putting cases, your elective joint replacement uh, cases on the schedule. Are they doing that the day before, two days before, a week before, or not at all, or is it the day of, basically? So I'm seeing some things coming back. A number of people are saying one day before, some are saying it's not closed. So that's, that's about typically what we, uh, what we see. So I'm going to introduce kind of a, a different concept to you. Oh, sorry, Bruno's going to close the poll as we, oh, some more results are coming in. It's not radically changing the results, it doesn't look like. But it looks like not closed is now the leading winner. Yes, it continues to be. For those of you who had side bets going on, not closed is, looks to be the winner, 20, 26%. I'm not surprised by that, um, especially in this environment where people are, uh, you know, hospitals want to make an inviting um, place for surgeons to do work. So I'm not saying that's a, a, a negative thing. But I want to expose you or get you to start to think about something else. It, something else. If the surgery schedule is closed a week prior for joint replacement clean cases, elective cases, I should say, that gives the team ample time to prepare for that patient. And it gives the patient ample time to get educated and be ready for their day of surgery. So in this example, we'll see if the Monday deadline for uh, Tuesday scheduling, and you see that you have to make sure your block release policy is in line with that. And this is not a flip the switch situation where you just immediately you know, shut off uh, the scheduling for, for these. So I would not advocate doing this uh, snap judgment on this. You have to work through it with your surgeons and partners, partner with them. But if you're able to close it on Monday, the schedule, for example, Tuesday have the weekly case review, that gives three full business working days to follow up on questions and unanswered things that need to be resolved before that day of surgery. The week of surgery, the patient is called on Monday, informed what time they need to show up because the schedule has been set, you know, it gives them their reminders and so on. Tuesday, the surgery takes place, and then they've got a two-day length of stay that has been planned for well ahead of time. So, Tim, I've seen the weekly case review implemented in hospitals and have really seen it as a pivotal opportunity for communication to occur, not only with those who are accepting the patients for surgery, but for their post-operative care. That said, I have seen it met with a lot of resistance yeah. the first time you yeah. really bring it up. <clears throat> so how do you provide some support to navigate that resistance? Yeah, you know, I think one of the most important things is, one, showing the benefits of doing a surgical case review. As I mentioned before, nobody wants another meeting for the sake of having a meeting. But if everyone clearly understands what the benefit is to not only the patient, which is, is of course, of supreme importance, but also internally. You know, I've seen been in so many envir hospital environments where there's all these phone calls going on and firefighting going on, trying to figure out what they're going to do for the particular patients. And those Herculean efforts are truly appreciated. But wouldn't it be nice if we could plan for these things well ahead of time. So you can see we've, you know, we've structured the benefits, and there's many, but here's four. Improved patient preparedness and satisfaction, better organized PTOT, 
fewer delays in day of surgery, which is a satisfier for everyone, from the patient to the surgeon, and a better organized surgery schedule. I believe that those are the real key selling points for doing a weekly surgical case review. So thank you, Tim. Um, currently, then, we have spoken to the importance of the process preoperatively in addition to the weekly surgical case review, so we have the patient you know, ready for surgery. Now we'll transition to what happens in the postoperative care processes and the importance of creating a structure for that. Jenna? Thanks, Michelle. Uh, another common thread that we see that really connects the idea of timing quality is the or idea of organization. Because there are so many moving pieces during this whole process, everyone really does need to understand what their part of the puzzle is and how their part interacts or affects everyone else. And the timing, again, is so essential to this. Think of all the times that you go into a patient's room or you try to go get the patient to get them back into the OR. They're either not there, someone else is working on them, they just had their lunch delivered. So it throws off your schedule for the day, it throws off the patient's schedule for the day, you're frustrated, the patient's stressed, nothing is happening like it's supposed to. That can extend length of stay, that can change a lot of different aspects of the patient's experience at the hospital. So what we want to do is we want to focus our efforts today looking at two large goals within the care, the care continuum, which is day of surgery mobility and discharge within two days. We're going to start with a question about your program's mobility protocol. So again, if you can use the uh, box at the right, which seems like you guys are all doing a great job with, what we want to understand is what is your current mobility process for post-op day zero? So A is those patients are on bed rest, so they have surgery, forget it, we can't get them up. Uh, B, the majority of your patients do are able to do a stand and pivot to the chair, but there's no real walking involved. Uh, C, majority of these patients are walking, but not long, it's not any farther than 30 feet. And then D is your majority of your patients are walking over 30 feet, they're out into the hallway, it's great, they, like, they love getting up um, and walking because it makes them uh, feel good. So oh, we've got our results coming in. Around the leader here is uh, B. Majority of patients are doing a stand pivot to the chair. The couple that are are doing more, which is great to see. Um, but I don't think uh, any of us in this room are surprised <laughs> at, at what we're seeing because there are so many different elements that go into getting that patient up on uh, on the day of surgery. We'll share those results with you. So around 32%. Um, and if we had that 5% that are on bed rest, we're up to around 37% of patients not really doing any walking on that post-op day, zero. So why are we even asking you about day of surgery mobility? There are many reasons to get the patient up and walking on the day of surgery. First of all, it helps to reduce the risk of the patient developing some sort of complication. They're up and walking, they reduce the risk of respiratory issues, Pressure, pressure ulcers, circulation issues, urinary issues, it's best to get them up and walking. Um, and a lot of quality reports are focusing a lot of their efforts on hospital-acquired conditions these days, and this is your opportunity to get ahead of it and affect that rate. Secondly, it reinforces the fact to the patient that they are a well patient. They're not sick, they had an issue with their knee, they came in, they got it fixed, let's get up and walk. Thirdly, it really does supercharge their recovery and gets them ready to go and be discharged sooner. They're up and walking and they're ready to go sooner and be able to discharge, be able to be discharged home. Now, as far as time is concerned for day of surgery mobility, what we're uh, looking at is that patients should be getting up within two hours of hitting your unit. And we've actually seen in some hospitals that PT meets the patient at the elevator and helps them walk back to their room. And you need to be considering that twice a day for that patient if that patient hits your unit uh, before noon. Now, obviously, this can be a stretch goal for a lot of you. Um, and you are not alone by any stretch of the imagination. There are many obstacles that our partners run into along the path to instituting something like this. Patients can get hung up in the PACU. They're stuck down there for hours. They don't make it up onto your unit for hours after surgery. They've been laying down this whole time and it's difficult to get them up. Others uh, we've heard of is the patient just flat out refuses. They're like, I'm old, I'm sick, I'm in pain, I don't want to get up. And then um, we, we see a lot now is that the, if the patient feels like they're in pain, if the nurses feel like they're in pain, 
um, and not managed well, it's really difficult for anyone to want to get up as well as want to make them get up if they are going to cause more pain for that patient. So it's interesting, Jenna, that you're tying poor pain management to limiting the impact of day of surgery mobility because we have seen great strides in the ability to manage a patient's pain and allow them to at least be clinically ready for that day of surgery mobility. So can you talk about how we've worked with hospitals to create some more consistency in leveraging the pain management tools they have at their access? Absolutely. And pain, you're true, you're right, because pain management doesn't always come up immediately when you're talking about day of surgery mobility, but it really should. Pain really is that equalizer of all of us. If we're in pain, we don't want to do anything else until it's under control. And this can be a tricky issue with patients and with providers, because the providers have to balance a lot of different issues. They're balancing pain management with their time management, with what they want to do with the OR, and all of, and of course, with costs. Um, there's always costs that they have to be concentrating on. And, but true patient quality looks at outcomes that matter to the patient in relation to cost and efficiency. And we all know that providers are going to take the path of least resistance. So that means you have to create the path of least resistance around getting that patient up on the day of surgery. And really how we've seen that occur is introducing more modern techniques, the use of a multimodal pain management protocol where pain, um, we're trying to get ahead of that pain before surgery, in surgery, and directly after it. The use of periarticular injection, the more use of regional anesthesia so that patient isn't feeling as sick afterwards. And then also reducing the use of any nerve blocks that have a motor component to them. Also, when it comes to the, the patient, the discussion has to start before they even get to the hospital to set those proper expectations. They need to understand they're going to have some pain. It's going to be different, but you are going to be there to help them manage it so that they can participate in their recovery because that's going to help them get out of the hospital and get home where they feel their best. They need to know when to take their pain meds and why it's so important to do that. And another element to, to work on is really scheduling those PT visits because this is a key step in organizing um, the patient's day. Everyone should know the day before, if not at, at the very least, um, how many joints are on the schedule. Or if you're talking what Tim was doing, you should know a week ahead of time how many joints are going to be on that schedule and when they should hit the unit. This makes it feasible to schedule those PT visits for the patient so that you know a PT is available and ready to see that patient. Patient, If the patient gets stuck in the PACU, send a PT down to PACU to see that patient. Um, we usually see the PT staff that's working the late shift the day before be able to schedule of these um, PTs to see those patients and also put it on the whiteboard if you can so that the patient knows and when to expect that PT um, to come in the room. Before we get on um, to our next piece, what I want to do um, is do another polling question to understand um, a little bit more about dis the discharging patient within two days. So what we'd like to do is test your knowledge a little bit. So what we want to understand is what, per what percentage of patients do you think are being discharged within two days for our top performers? Is it more like 26%, 36%, 56%, or 77% of the patients are able to be discharged within two days? So that means two days or sooner for these patients these, um, are being able to be discharged. Wow, that's, that's great to see that everyone thinks it's 77%. That's our, our winner right now at 42%. Um, and I, I want to tell them, I want to tell them, <laughs> and you're right, <laughs> that 77% is. That's our, what our uh, top performers are able to do is uh, almost uh, three quarter, uh, more than three quarters of the patients are being able to be discharged in two days or sooner. So Jenna, as we've seen the length of stay continue to migrate uh, lower and lower, and hospitals are challenged with ensuring that their patient gets either a better or equally um, as important outcome that they had in a longer length of stay in a shorter time period, what are some of the strategies that you can talk about um, that really enforce a lesser length of stay and increases the importance of an outcome achieved in um, two days or less uh, length of stay? Sure. Um, let's, get, let's take one step back before we get to the, the actual elements and just think about, again, the, the why. Why is this so important now? One element to consider is Medicare, because um, that's something that's a large percentage of, 
uh, the patients these days. And the fact that they are setting that geometric mean length to stay, and it keeps going down. And we're around uh, a two days at this moment. But it really is better for the patient to get out of the hospital as quick and safe as possible. We all know the, the millions of bugs and stuff that are flying around our hospitals. And if we've got a well patient on our hands, we want to get them home without them contracting anything or develop anything, get them home so that they can uh, recover uh, in the, the safety and the comfort of their own home. Also, CMS and other organizations and institutions are routinely, routinely reporting readmissions and complications as part of their quality reports, part of their rating systems at the hospital. And so again, the less chance that patient has of developing something, um, the better off you are. Now, this can feel like a stretch for a lot of you on the phone. If you're discharging the majority of your patients on post sub day three, the idea of shifting a whole day um, off of it can seem scary and completely understandable. So you can create progressive smaller goals. I uh, shifted up earlier in the morning on post sub day three, shifted then later on post sub day two in the evening to get the patient home. And then you can get there to that day two. Because we understand that what we're what we're suggesting and, and what the real trend is in healthcare right now is making sure that you accomplish everything you were in three days, but now accomplishing it in just two. And obviously, this doesn't come without challenge. <coughs> if everyone doesn't communicate the patient goals, the progress, the issues, patients can end up staying longer in the hospital than necessary. If the patient and the family aren't prepared and that expectation set, it can be difficult to convince them that, this, that they are well enough to go home or better off at home, especially if they know someone like Jeannie down the street had their knee replaced six years ago and they were able to stay in the hospital you know, for four years and they got this really cool CPM on their knee and then they got to go to the best rehab hospital afterwards and they got weighted on hand and foot. So it can be difficult to fight that once the patient's in the hospital, so the best idea is to do that before. And then, of course, if the patient isn't properly optimized, they can develop some medical issues while they're under your care. Um, the good news is that there are many ways to combat these barriers. Firstly, organizing the preoperative process to include proper expectation setting, discharge planning, and patient optimization is essential. You have to have enough time to get all these accomplished, though. So that goes back to what we've been talking about earlier with that preoptimization process is building it so that you have enough time. Sometimes it can take multiple people talking with the patient. It can take having case management sit down with the patient and develop a discharge plan, or multiple different methods of education, a book, a discussion, and a webinar for them to understand it. And messaging is huge. This is what we hear with every single hospital we walk into. If everyone along the way reinforces the same message, it's much easier to get that patient out when you um, want to get them out, when they should be ready to get out. If you've got one person along the way that says, oh, honey, don't worry about it. You can stay here as long as you need to. Forget it. It is now hotel, memorial hospital, and you just have a new person in for your week. So getting all of the stakeholders together and really working out a messaging plan. And it's more of just this is what you should say. It's arming them with the information that they need if the patient argues with them or challenges them on something. If they're talking to the pre-op nurse and they say, oh, I think I'm going to be in way too much pain to go home in two days. This, this isn't going to work for me. Make sure that that pre-op nurse has the information she needs to combat that about how their pain is going to be managed appropriately, what they're going to do to make sure that that happens. And another um, way to combat this is with the daily huddle. These daily huddles can be short little meetings in the morning where there's a group of people that are taking care of those patients get to talk about three questions. What's the patient's discharge goal? Are there any barriers to achieving it? And if so, what do we need to do to remove them? If that discharge goal is uh, that patient needs to go home tomorrow and they have a couple more things that they need to do to hit that discharge checklist and that stuff better get done today, and what are we going to do? And that becomes the patient's plan of care for that day. It's also helpful if you involve the patient in that. So getting a bingo card or a checklist in their room so they can participate is another great way um, to get the patients involved and feel like they're ready to go home. Thanks, Jenna. If you recall, earlier in the presentation, we talked about the worst case scenario, which, as we mentioned, was a little dramatic. Hopefully, not all of those things occur with a patient at one time, but it's the opportunity for a few of those to occur that really challenges their quality outcomes. 
So now what you see here are some of the best case scenarios for each of those parts of the episode of care preoperatively. If you look at some of the strategies that were discussed on the preoperative patient optimization and scheduling the weekly case review, that really changes your ability to be prepared for that patient's medical needs as well as the equipment and the process for the postoperative care. If you look at some of the strategies that uh, Jenna has spoken to related to um, making sure the patient is mobile on the day of surgery, and we see huge changes when that patient gets BIDPT on the day of surgery. This remarkable change that the patient has from a pain management perspective as well as mobility is really impressive to see from a therapist's perspective. They're always um, thrilled to see how you can progress their capabilities much sooner. And then from a post-acute care setting, if you've transitioned that patient to that next level of care, which is mostly on the home care side as we've, we've seen, how do you make sure that patient has an outstanding outcome from the point of your surgical intervention. So many of those strategies can be applied to a, a create a quality outcome for your patient. And the one that you have designed based on your education that you provided to them preoperatively. So in summary, we've talked about these four key areas, preoperative patient optimization, weekly case review, safe surgery, mobility, and discharge to home. What we would like to do now is open it up to questions regarding these four specific areas. Um, it's helpful for you to just raise your hand on the right. We'll be able to call on you and open up your mic so that you can talk. So while we're looking for anybody raising their hand, I'll turn it to Tim, because one of the questions that came through from a, a chat perspective was, how do you implement the weekly case review when there are multiple, multiple providers? Yeah. So you mentioned it with Dr. Booth, neat and tidy, a yeah. high volume, but one surgeon. Yeah. I'm sure then they're wondering, what do I do with five surgeons? Yeah, absolutely. And we, we do see that uh, where there's two, three, four surgeons, each of them doing a fair number of volume. So a couple things you can do. Number one is to schedule uh, a rotating surgeon attendance. So everybody else on that, you remember the wheel that I showed you that shows the attendees uh, earlier uh, in the slide presentation. And so all of them stay put, and the agenda has already been set, and the surgeon themselves rotates in. They do their five, six, six cases, and then they rotate out, and so it's, it's scheduled that way. That is sometimes doable, particularly with surgeons who uh, have a, a schedule that is set, and they are also doing surgery, or they're in the building at the same time. Maybe their clinic is in the building, so there's less variability of when they can arrive. The other piece of that, uh, or th if that is not an option, another option is to have um, have them uh, just the top surgeons, and I mean volume-wise, not the but the, the surgeons who are bringing the most volume. Start with them, and uh, if you need to do two uh, two surgical case reviews to make sure that they get um, with all their patients planned, then that's what you do. Um, so sometimes not easy to do, but certainly worth the effort uh, to go through. That, that's very <clears throat> helpful. Stephanie, we've opened your line. You've raised your hand for a question. Um, yeah, I had a couple questions about optimization. Um, what do you guys do whenever the surgeons don't really listen to the optimization provider and what they recommend? In that very rare instance that that has occurred, <laughs> yeah, that, that certainly is a, a challenge, uh, Stephanie. I'll turn it over to Jenna. So it's, you're talking about the the physician that's in charge of the optimization and what they're suggesting that they do to optimize that patient. Is that yeah. correct? Mm -hmm. uh, a, a lot of that, um, what we would suggest is to go back through um, your orthopedic group or your orthopedic um, committee to get that um, done. It's also great to, if you do have physicians that are participating and optimizing their patient is showing the differences in the outcomes. Most likely there will be stark differences um, between the outcomes. And if you can get at least one provider on your side to try that pilot, it can make it a little bit better. And what at least in my experience I've seen is if you can show that this is the right path for the right reasons, they're a little bit more reasonable as far as trying it. Because a lot of the time it's fear of not what's going to happen for the patient, but it's going to interrupt their normal cycle, and they don't want to waste any time. That's yeah. usually what we see more than, I don't think this is necessary for the patient. It's something's going to happen um, to my timing, and I don't want that to happen. 
So if you can quell that fear, usually they're a little bit um, more inclined to get on board. Yeah. Would you guys recommend it be like a mid-level, like a PA or a nurse practitioner or a physician? That can be very specific, and I know that there are some legal issues in certain states that you have to look at, but it's mainly what people feel the most comfortable with. We've seen it work with mid-levels. We've seen it work with uh, hospitalists whatever makes the most sense and, and your providers feel comfortable with. That's something that we've run into where some surgeons don't want to listen to, and I'm putting in air quotes, um, a mid-level um, because they, uh, they don't think that they're on the same level. So if that's the case in, in your specific um, political climate there, then it's probably better to use a hospitalist or a primary care physician. If not, if everyone's all right with that and it's like, hey, listen, we'll do this and the hospital will provide that person, sometimes, again, they're more inclined to participate in that process because it does take one piece off their lap. Yeah, it's just tough because then if they still don't agree, you know, then we can't. So. And you hit them over the head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah you, you forgot to write that strategy down, Jenna. <laughs> uh, Stephanie, I think that is something that um, you know, we present this information in that it all goes well. I think you're presenting very realistic uh, challenges that we have seen in many organizations. What I can say is that hopefully you at least have that 80-20% role. So if you can garner support of at least 80% of your physicians, that's 80 more percent than you had before the optimization approach. And then what you do have to ensure is that for that 20% who isn't really being compliant with your approach, you have to ensure that you put strategies in place to mitigate the risks of postoperative complications. So that does cause more work for the care team, but it's ensuring that those patients don't lose out on a quality outcome just because there is variance of opinions from an approach. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? We see Dennis, you raised your hand, but we um, we don't have your call in to unmute you. Yeah, Dennis. Okay. Hello. Hi, Dennis. Hey, hey. Um, there there's a big initiative out here in Washington State with some physicians over in Seattle that are collaborating with our guys about doing same-day joint replacement with an overall goal of identifying um, um, optimal candidates and potentially as many as 50% having same-day hip and knee replacements. Are you hearing, seeing that, and um, what's the landscape? Well, we absolutely have seen a move towards outpatient or same-day surgery. Um, in our experience, some of the physicians are feeling more comfortable to start the outpatient procedure, if you will, as same day under the hospital roof. They have more access to resources should something go in a different direction for that patient. That said, 50% is probably a, a very high number for what we have seen from a literature or capability perspective. Um, but if you have, you know, the right patient population, a younger, more healthy population as part of your a portfolio of patients, if you will, then that does, you know, create some opportunity. Uh, the challenges that we have seen with hospitals or surgeons trying to quickly move towards a same-day or outpatient surgery is they don't have the safety net that you as all hospital providers support them with with all of the post-operative care. So they do need to ensure that all of those things that happen on day two or even in those next couple days for those patients who are transitioned to home you need to ensure that they are still safe and that their pain is well managed, that they're not, they can identify what the risks of complications are. So those are some of the concerns that we have um, with those surgeons moving towards an outpatient um, setting without having that safety net and defined processes. So we are working with hospitals to implement outpatient joint replacement strategies. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? We'd like to thank everybody for their participation in Accelerative Quality Collaborative. We are absolutely open to additional suggestions on future topics. 
or if there are any future questions, uh, please feel free to email me. My uh, email address is there, and we can make sure that we get the right expert here to uh, answer your questions.